Number 10, an advocate for Maui. Oprah has been claiming to be many things since this Maui backlash thing has started. A good boss, a charitable woman, and an advocate for the island of Maui. By starting this fund and donating her spare millions, she's made her mark in the public as a woman who cares. So much so that she's asking you to give her your money. Isn't that nice? As mentioned in previous videos, Oprah would not care about Maui or its people if she didn't have a vested stake on the island. Oprah's had property in Maui for quite some time, being almost a second home to her. When the fire started raging, she started fundraising. Think about all of the things that have happened in the past few years. We all forgot about Australia being set on fire in 2020. A lot of Western Canada was on fire earlier this year. And some parts of Florida have been underwater for a long time and they just kind of live with it. Yet Oprah has dedicated her time and money to helping out the area where she has a vacation home. Do with that what you will. Number nine, the NDAs. Confidentiality agreements are not uncommon in the world of Hollywood. Marvel will literally track you down if you say anything about their movies to anyone. In Kitty Kelly's tell-all book about Oprah, the author mentions there were confidentiality agreements that co-workers and guests were made to sign. This included everyone from Tom Cruise to the guy who made his breakfast in the morning. Over 500 staff members were forced to sign these documents with one former employee, Elizabeth Cody, trying to write a book about her time working for Oprah, but she was eventually stopped by the courts, still being tied to the agreement. The NDAs were not meant to be a way to just keep show secrets safe, but any and all of Oprah's secrets as well. According to Elizabeth, the document was signed by almost everybody in Oprah's life, and she may have had this brand of sweetness and kindness, but that it was just not how she was. Elizabeth felt that she was in Oprah's pocket after she signed the paperwork. In 2010, there was even a lawsuit filed against Oprah and her company from a training performance center that was claiming that they were fired for violating the terms of her agreement, but all they did was just advertise that they were doing stuff for her show, so I'm not sure what's wrong there. Number eight, diva. On air, Oprah is portrayed as this wholesome sweet lady, but according to her stepmother, there's actually this unknown side to Oprah, hidden from fans for years. According to Barbara, Oprah is one of the most controlling people that you're ever gonna meet. She claims that Oprah does not allow herself and her husband to stay at Oprah's home whenever they try to visit, which means that they have to stay in hotels with money out of their own pockets. Barbara also said that Oprah was very quick to anger when it came to her staff especially, with a lot of people being fired over the years left and right for the littlest things. But that's not all. Despite being a billionaire, Barbara allows Oprah to stay at her home when she visits, which she just complains about the entire time. The first time she ever stayed there, Oprah allegedly complained that her bed sheets weren't a thousand threads and that her bath towel wasn't big enough, but that's fair. This woman has billions of dollars to do literally anything she wants, and what, and what she wants to do is make her family feel like a burden to the world. Number seven, controversial beliefs. Oprah has had plenty of controversial people onto her show, from so-called medical experts to psychologists to celebrities. Whatever's good for TV, it's good for Oprah. One particular incident that caused a ton of backlash for Oprah was when she did an interview with Suzanne Somers. She was brought onto the show to share her beauty secrets on how she was able to look so young. According to Summers, this treatment that she does on a regular basis would help people. She claimed that she rubs estrogen cream into her skin on one arm and smears progesterone into the other arm. Um, progesterone is just a fancy way of saying steroids. She also claimed that she took 60 60 supplements and vitamins a day, 40 in the morning and 20 before bed. What really stirred the pot was that this woman claimed to be a health expert and self-help author. But surprise, surprise, doctor she was not. Medical experts started bashing Oprah, claiming that this type of extreme hormone therapy was actually the cause of several diseases and illnesses, you know, like cancer. Despite Suzanne's claims that her specially made non-FDA approved bioidenticals were natural and safe, they were actually just synthetic conventional hormones that you could buy from a pharmacy. The little label smacked on the front. Oprah did everything in her power to sell this idea to her audience, believing 100% that these methods were useful, even claiming to have used the methods to make herself feel incredible. So Oprah would rather risk her audience getting cancer than telling them the truth. Solid. Number six. The free cars. Who could forget Oprah's famous words? You get a car, you get a car, everybody got a car. The moment was historical on her series and was parodied time and time again and it still does to this day. However, what a lot of people do not know is that it wasn't as simple as here's some car keys, go have fun. That would be insane. No, when someone gives you anything on television, especially if it's free, there's a catch. For Oprah's audience, the catch was that if they wanted to drive away in their brand new car, they'd have to pay over $7,000 in taxes 
first. While Oprah Studio would cover the sales tax and registration for the cars, their audience members were given a choice to either pay seven grand and take the car, or just simply keep that cash instead. The famous moment she shouted this on the show featured 11 real teachers who were, according to Oprah, in desperate need of a new car. They, along with the audience members, received keys in a box on camera that Oprah claimed to be for their new cars. Everything has a catch though, even now. For someone who was known for being charitable and generous, the word free really does mean something different to Oprah. Number 5. The Fabricated Memoirs This is a time when Oprah kind of ruined someone's life when she brought them onto her show. Oprah launched her book club in 1996, a reading encouraging segment from her talk show that, that turned any book that she chose into a bestseller. In September 2005, Winfrey picked A Million Little Pieces, a brutal and painful memoir by James Frett about his years long struggle with substance control issues. A Million Little Pieces became the best selling nonfiction book of that year and Frey was asked to appear on her talk show to discuss the book that Oprah called gut wrenching. However, the following year a news outlet ran a very expositive article about Frey after it was discovered that he made up or juiced large portions of his memoir. For example, there is a section of the book that tells a story of Frey surviving a fatal train crash that took the lives of two teenagers. Well, he was never on that train and he didn't have anything to do with that situation. He just wrote about it and was like, oh, it was there. Weeks after the article broke, Oprah asked Frey to return to the show where he faced livid viewers and an even more livid Oprah. She told James that she she felt duped and betrayed, which was a feeling that was shared by her audience and millions of readers around the world. When she asked James why he felt the need to lie to herself and her readers, he tried everything, making every excuse he could think of, and he claimed that he altered a lot of details, but that the overall plot was real. While the studio audience responded with a massive wave of boos, gasps, and groans, and Winfrey later apologized for the mistreatment from her audience, because that wasn't her intention. But the damage was already done, and this dude's career as a writer is non-existent. Number Number 4. Lance Armstrong Seven time Tour de France winner Lance Armstrong has gone down in history as a man who is unable to ride a bike without chemical training wheels. In an interview with Oprah Winfrey in 2013, Lance was brought on to discuss the allegations floating around regarding his status as a Tour de France winner. Several sources claimed that Lance had to take performance enhancing substances to win each and every race, as well as a type of transfusion involving the red life juice that flows inside all of us. Armstrong went on air and fessed up to every single thing that people were claiming he had done, however he did deny the notion that he was like a mastermind who would control his teammates and force them to join in his extracurricular activities. But amidst his admission of guilt, say that 10 times fast, there was a moment where he tried to pin the situation on his battle with cancer. He wraps it up by saying that he should have tried harder to cancel the culture rather than to create a problem. Well, unfortunately for him, he was stripped of all 7 Tour de France titles and has since lived in exile among the cycling community. Number 3. Where's the beef? In spring of 1996, the United Kingdom apparently experienced an outbreak of bovine spongiform encephalopathy, or mad cow disease, uh, since I can't pronounce that last word. According to the FDA, the disease destroys cows' central nervous system, and if humans eat the infected meat, you get zombies that can't um, No, you can contract a deadly variant called Kreutzfeldt Jacob disease, probably named after the first dude who got the disease. During the mad cow scare, the Oprah Winfrey show booked Howard Lyman, the former cow cattle rancher had adopted a vegetarian lifestyle and he went to work for the Humane Society's Eating with Co-Science Animal Welfare campaign and he appeared on the show to discuss the threat of mad cows to America. He pointed out that feeding the remains of mad cow to infected cattle or other animals could have facilitated the spread and that a lot of that was happening in the US right then and there. Oprah was stunned and vowed that she would never eat another burger ever again. Well it turns out her influence and her millions of viewers were so large that only a few hours after the episode aired and she declared that she wasn't eating hamburgers ever again, the price of beef stock plummeted, staying at an all time low for two months. In fact, one Texas rancher lost an estimated $6.7 million and organized a class action lawsuit against Oprah and her show for talking trash about beef. After a six week trial, she won, leaving one dude with no farm and out hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal fees. Number two, trespasser. So. There is a video circulating the internet that a lot of people are interpreting as a direct message to Oprah Winfrey. Jason Momoa released a video on his Instagram a few weeks ago urging tourists not to come to Maui as the place was on fire and you know, they didn't need anybody's help. He claimed that he appreciated anyone sharing love for the people of Maui and continued to say that there was someone trying to like scam people out of money that was pretending to be him online. After sharing links to several sites that were directly linked to putting money into the pockets of the people of Maui, fans decided to 
focus on the bit about people staying away. Now, at the same time that this was happening, Oprah and The Rock had announced the People's Fund of Maui, and the thing was that that caused a lot of backlash for Oprah. And in Jason's video, he does not include a link to the charity and doesn't even acknowledge its existence. He has since spoken about the charity, but has never actually said the names Oprah or Dwayne out loud. People are just putting two and two together, though, and the internet has decided that Jason Momoa has called Oprah Winfrey a trespasser. Number one, Whoopi Goldberg. In author Kitty Kelly's unauthorized Oprah biography, Kelly claims that Whoopi Goldberg became a persona non grata or an unwelcome person in Oprah's life after Whoopi was nominated for an Oscar for her role in The Color Purple. The book noted that following the honor, the comedian never appeared on Oprah's show again and was noticeably shunned from her 2006 Legends Ball. It wasn't until Oprah invited the entire cast of The Color Purple onto the show that the so-called feud was addressed. It turns out that Oprah had actually ran into Whoopi at Tyler Perry's party sometime after the 2006 snub. Goldberg confronted Oprah, leading to a hilariously adorable moment where Oprah asked why Whoopi was mad at her, to which Whoopi was like, well, I'm not mad at you, I thought you were mad at me, what's going on here? They mutually agreed that they really should have just picked up the phone a long time ago and figured the whole thing out and settled the dispute. In the number 10 spot is Katy Perry and Riff Raff. People called their relationship the most awkward and cruel joke prom date ever. It was just a few months after Katie broke up with John Mayer that dating rumors about her and Riff Raff started to emerge. They shocked everyone when they showed up on the red carpet together wearing matching outfits and claiming to be a couple. Matching jean outfits, by the way. I don't think many people got too invested in their relationship because people didn't believe that it was real or they just didn't want to believe that it was real. Either way, just a few weeks after these epic red carpet pictures, Riff was spotted in a brothel and claiming to be a single man. So maybe it's just like a way for Katie to get some like innocent jealousy revenge on John, you know what I mean? But you know, I feel like she was just trying to make her ex-man jealous. Up next, number nine, we have Michelle Rodriguez and Zac Efron. Back in 2014, people were both shocked and confused when vacation pictures surfaced of them holding hands, kissing, and getting all cozy and stuff. People were quick out to point out the red flag, saying that the whole thing just seemed really fake. She was a decade older than Zac, he was 20 and she was 36 and she was dating model Cara Delevingne just a few months prior to these photos. After the vacation photos, the next headlines were one month later when they split up. They were only together for over a month. Apparently they broke up after an argument in Ibiza when Michelle said that Zach was looking for something serious and she wasn't. Swiping the number 8 spot is Jennifer Aniston and Vince Vaughn. People might think that their relationship was fake because they never wanted Jen and Brad Pitt to break up. Let's be honest. So no matter who she dated, people might just say like that it was fake because they were just talking smack. Jennifer and Vince were working together on the 2006 comedy movie The Breakup when they allegedly started dating. Paparazzi photos were leaked online, showing them being cuddly, but sources say that they were hardly ever together. It almost seemed a little bit just too sketchy that they broke up after the movie came out. Once it was on DVD and the promotion stopped. You know, like they just broke up, so it seemed like weird timing. Did they date for the movie to promote it? Did they break up because the breakup was over? You know what I mean? Just the timing of that was a little sketchy. Sliding into number seven is Kaylee Cuoco and Henry Cavill. I know I'm not the only one who thought this couple was like super random. Around the time that his movie Man of Steel came out in 2013, he had started to date Kaylee, who was well into her career from The Big Bang Theory. But people started questioning if it was all for publicity. During an interview, Kaylee mentioned that they were getting photographed a lot. She said, I had no one following me until I met Superman. There had been not one paparazzi photo of me until like seven months ago. Their highly publicized relationship only lasted weeks and people pointed out that they both had the same publications firm. Kaylee ended up marrying Ryan Sweeting just three months after her and Henry split. And at number six is Nicki Minaj and DJ Khaled. You might be sitting there saying you didn't even know they dated, let alone got engaged, but that is because the whole proposal was 
fake. In the end, it turned out to be a publicity stunt that even Nikki was a little surprised about. In 2013, DJ Khaled proposed to Nikki on MTV, and it seemed genuine to everyone watching. Nikki even wore the ring for a while, and she acted totally shocked by the proposal too. But later, she came clean and said that she was shocked by the proposal, but at the same time, she never thought that it was real. She knew what Khaled was doing, and it was all a PR stunt to help promote their upcoming song that they were collaborating on. Called I Wanna Be With You. How fitting, you get what I say? I wanna be with you! So he proposes and they have this thing. Halfway through this countdown is Kim Kardashian and Chris Humphreys. You know something didn't come across as genuine when you have to do an interview on whether your marriage was fake or not. The relationship has been an ongoing debate for years with fans saying the whole thing was just one big publicity stunt. Kanye West is not Kim's first husband. She was actually married to Chris at one point and the whole thing was captured on the reality show Keeping Up With The Kardashians. The sixth season of their show made more gross than other seasons because of their relationship drama and people couldn't help but think it was all planned. They were only married for 72 days and they both received a ton of money for their televised wedding, so it would make sense. But Chris has always denied that the relationship was fake. We're moving on to number four and we have Tana Mojo and Jake Paul. Unlike our last number, these two have openly admitted to the relationship being fake. When they first started dating, fans were super excited, but then they got engaged just after a month or two of them dating, so people started to question what their intentions were. Their engagement happened on a stage in Vegas and seemed a little bit too staged, but it was nothing compared to their wedding in Vegas, which they made a fortune off of. They planned this entire wedding, filmed the whole process, and charged fans $50 to watch watch it online. Turns out in the end they were never even dating, apparently they didn't sleep together, and they were all just friends, and they just did it for glow. It really did seem real in moments though, but they were never legally married, so if you're wondering if they got a divorce, they uh, they didn't have to. Um, and they quickly started dating other people after that. Alright guys, we're at number 3 and we have Renee Zellweger and Bradley Cooper. The two of them met in 2006 while filming their movie Case 39, but rumors about the relationship didn't happen until 3 years later just before the film was going to premiere. Coincidence? Some people will say so. People were questioning their intentions because they tried to keep the relationship out of the public eye as much as possible. But they started dating in 2009 and dated for 2 years. So like I personally feel like you can't fake it for that long. Like that's way too much time to fake a relationship. But this year in 2020, the two of them reunited at the Oscar Awards and they looked like they were getting a little friendly. Rumors started spreading the day after, claiming that the two of them had a sleepover after the event, but it was never confirmed. Their movie Case 39 had completely bombed at the box office, so even if it was a PR stunt, it did not work or make a difference on the film's success. So I personally don't think this one was fake. Taking over the number two spot is Big Ed and Rose. One of the hardest things to decipher about the show 90 Day Fiance is if the relationship is real or if they are just trying to use their partner for citizenship, money, or even fame. It's always a really awkward debate, and on the latest season, people started calling out Ed and Rose for not being truthful. The two of them went viral after some of their funny clips turned into memes and gifts that people use on a daily basis. Some people accused Rose as being fake since her sister messaged and asked Ed for money since their family struggles financially, and others accuse Ed for being fake because he just wanted a young beautiful girl to marry on TV. They aren't together and didn't make it through the show, but they are both huge on social media. Like People love following them, even like as individuals. Earning the number one spot on our list is Harry Styles and Taylor Swift. It could be considered the most debated relationship out there because of the media attention that it got, and maybe that was the point. Every time Taylor starts dating someone, she gets a ton of media attention and her breakups receive even more, which is part of the reason why people claim that she faked a relationship with Harry Styles, all for a publicity stunt. People thought they fabricated their breakup more than anything because Taylor 
Taylor allegedly just kept doing things to get media attention. Like during her performance of We Are Never Getting Back Together at the Grammy Awards, she apparently faked a British accent during the break in the song to kind of mock him. And she also thanked him when she won the award for her song. Since the song was about their breakup, she apparently owes him this one. It just seemed like maybe they went out of their way for media, if that makes sense. So uh, a lot of people think they faked it. In at number 10, Megan Fox and Machine Gun Kelly. Megan Fox and Machine Gun Kelly are the hot new couple on the block in Hollywood. But a lot of people are not buying the relationship and with how public that they've been, experts are pretty sure that it's a PR stunt. Here are just a few examples of why people think that it's fake. Firstly, in Megan's interview on the Give Them La La with Randall podcast, Megan Fox revealed that she knew Machine Gun Kelly was her quote soulmate even before they met. And apparently after she heard MGK was cast as the other lead in the film, she already felt the connection deep in her soul. I don't know, it's a little suspicious. Also, MGK claims that he literally did nothing on set but pine and obsess over Megan Fox. They've also been all over social media claiming that they're twin flames. Megan also made waves by starring in MGK's music video for Bloody Valentine. And personally, I believe that Megan Fox needed a hot new relationship to get her name back in the spotlight as well as to promote their new movie together. So it just seems pretty convenient to me. And at number nine, Rob Kardashian and Black China. I fully believe that this relationship was entirely orchestrated by China for two reasons. I think the first reason was to get famous off of the Kardashian name, but the second was to get some low-key revenge on the Kardashian family because Kylie stole her baby daddy, Tyga. It seemed all too convenient when Rob and China got together and they moved at pretty much lightning speed, getting engaged and then learning they were pregnant. The couple also got their own show, Rob and China, out of that relationship, which was lucrative for both of them. And even though it was a complete mess, they got major publicity for the both of them and gave tons of storylines for keeping up with the Kardashians as well. Of course, the two have a child together, so I'm sure some part of the relationship was real, but I also believe a lot of it was fake. In at number eight, Selena Gomez and The Weeknd. Selena Gomez and The Weeknd had a brief public relationship right after both of them broke up with their respective partners. But this relationship just seemed incredibly convenient. And honestly, these two people did not seem compatible whatsoever to me, which led to a lot of people thinking this relationship was actually fake. Here are a few reasons why. Firstly, the two got very public very fast and were paparazzi at music festivals like Coachella and out on the streets of LA. But they never posted anything to their own social media profile which could be proof that they never spent any time together alone, only in front of the cameras. Also, there were tons of blind gossip forums that claimed that many in the industry knew that it was just a publicity stunt. The last and most important piece of evidence for me was that both of them were seen out with their exes, Justin Bieber and Bella Hadid, almost right after Selena and Abel's breakup. And with all that combined, I'm pretty convinced that it was just a publicity stunt. In at number seven, Emma Stone and Andrew Garfield. These two coincidentally started dating the same time that they were starring his love interest in the Spider-Man franchise. And that's pretty much the biggest sign of a fake relationship that there is. However, I do have to say that these two are pretty much the only couple that I actually thought were good together and like could be a thing in the real world. One of the biggest reasons people think that this was a fake relationship is because they were together during the promotions for Spider-Man, but split up once the movie didn't need any more promotion. Then after taking a break, they ended up getting back together when they were both up for the Oscars and seemingly when they needed some much needed publicity. And although none of this is so solid proof, which is very like interesting timing. In at number six, Timothy Chalamet and Lily Rose Depp. This is another couple that started because they were in love interests on the movie that they were part in called The King. Both Timothy and Lily are rising stars and it made sense for both of them to get in a relationship together to get even more publicity, especially since they're a very good looking couple, I have to admit. The situation here is that they were spotted out together in New York City in paparazzi pictures, of course, looking pretty cozy together, but everyone wasn't convinced that they were actually together together until they showed up to the Venice Film Festival hand in hand. But there is a chance that their management didn't think that they were selling their love story good enough. So days after the festival, these photos of them kissing on a boat were released and they show very clear romantic interest, along with a whole lot more that we won't get into. But there has been a lot of talk that this photo is staged because it's almost impossible for paparazzi to get that close of a shot unless the celebrities let them. Halfway at number five, Kristen Stewart and Robert Pattinson. Looking back, this relationship was really unfortunate and they both looked pretty uncomfortable the whole time, especially Kristen Stewart. In the beginning, I honestly just thought she was an awkward person, but seeing how she's changed over the recent years, it's clear that 
she was just putting on a show to promote Twilight. Their relationship of course coincided with the creation of the hit Twilight franchise and ended right about the same time. They were together for a very short time after the franchise ended until Kristen cheated on Robert with a film director. But Robert didn't seem too sad about it and actually got engaged only a short while after that. So to me, this situation seemed like two people who were dying for Twilight to end so they could date who they really wanted to. And at number four, Camila Cabello and Shawn Mendes. This is another relationship that I'm convinced started out as a PR stunt, but ended up turning into a real relationship. The pair met in 2014 when they were both on tour with Austin Mahone and they were apparently friendly. They even released a song together. But everything changed when they released the hit song Senorita that went on to be a smash hit. A big part of the success was the fact that the two of them started dating in the midst of it and literally could not keep their hands off each other. And at first with the level of PDA that they were showing, it looked very fake. But since it's been a few years and they're still together, I believe the fake relationship ended up blossoming into a real one. And at number three, Zac Efron and Vanessa Hudgens. Since these two were so young when they started making the High School Musical movies, I don't think that this relationship was exactly arranged, but I'm pretty confident that it was strongly encouraged. These two started dating during filming and they broke up practically right when High School Musical was no longer on TV. And since I was a preteen at this time and totally eating up their entire relationship, I can definitely say that them dating in real life made the movies just so much better for me personally. There was also a rumor that at one point Zac Efron and Ashley Tisdale were dating, but they weren't allowed to go public with it because there needed to be the illusion that Troy and Gabriella were the ones that were actually together IRL. And at number two, Noah Cyrus and Lil Xan. I think these two were in a fake relationship because they both needed publicity pretty badly and frankly, it worked. We also got the legendary photo of Zan kissing Noah on the cheek on the red carpet and getting his face like smushed in. Really cringy photo. After speculation that the short relationship was staged, Lil Zan actually confirmed it. He said, quote, showed us to Columbia Records too for setting up that fake relationship. I didn't want to do it to be completely honest. It was just added work to my schedule. You know what I mean? Noah immediately clapped back saying the relationship was not staged and it started when he hit her up over DMs. But her trying to deny that the relationship is faked was honestly just a little suspicious for me. And finally, number one, Taylor Swift and Harry Styles. If you've ever wanted wondered if this relationship was faked, apparently a biography about Harry's life is coming out by Louisa Jepson, and in it she claims that the relationship was in fact fake. Apparently One Direction's team quote went to great lengths to put the two together because she's such a huge star. Adding quote, anytime Taylor starts dating a new guy, she gets a flurry of media attention and her breakups receive even more, Jepson said in the book. And one reason I believe this could be true is because this relationship was one of her most public and she made a few dates to Harry that were picked up by the press and fueled their alleged feud. And a lot of people assume that she wouldn't be that savage unless she knew that he was in on it. At number 10, Matt LeBlanc. Remember that one episode of Friends where they joked about Joey being in an adult film? You know, the one where he played the copy machine guy? Well, did you know that that bit was actually based on real life? Yes, Matt LeBlanc, the actor who played Joey Tribbiani in Friends, actually had a part in an adult entertainment series before his time on Friends. Matt had a role in a Showtime series called The Red Shoe Diaries. This show was about a man who had written an ad for a newspaper asking people to send in their stories about life-changing encounters that they've had with their partners. The man who was the show's narrator would begin each episode by reading a letter aloud, and well, I'm sure you can imagine the rest. Matt LeBlanc had a steady role in the show, and though it isn't necessarily a traditional adult film setting, it's still funny to imagine him in this role, and it's still made for some pretty funny content on Friends. At number 9, Tim Allen. Today we know Tim Allen as an actor and comedian known for his roles on Home Improvement, the Santa Claus films, and Toy Story, but before his rise to fame, he was actually a felon. In 1978, just shortly after beginning his stand-up career, Tim was caught by drug-sniffing dogs at the Kalamazoo Battle Creek International Airport, carrying 1.4 pounds of that good old no-no snow. After being caught with the illegal substance, he faced life imprisonment, but luckily for him, he was offered a deal. In exchange for helpful information, he would be given a reduced sentence. Clearly, he took the deal, otherwise we wouldn't be talking about him right now. Tim ended up ratting on the other dealers he knew, and his sentence was subsequently reduced to three to seven years behind bars, rather than a life sentence. Tim was released from prison 28 months later at the age of 29, and because he was a convicted felon, he found it hard to find work, so he tried giving stand-up comedy another go. Obviously, it was a good choice, and Tim is now a household name. So perhaps getting caught was the best thing that has ever happened to him. Before I continue on, with this list, I'd like to ask you guys to consider leaving a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far because it really does help us out a lot. 
At number 8, Leighton Meester. Leighton Meester, the actress known for playing Blair Waldorf on Gossip Girl, shares something in common with Tim Allen, being that they've both spent time behind bars, though for very different reasons. Leighton was born in prison. Yep, you heard that right. This all came out around the beginning of Gossip Girl's run on TV, and everyone was shocked. Essentially, Leighton's mom was arrested in 1983 for trying to smuggle 1,200 pound shipments of Mary Jane out of Jamaica. Leighton's mom, Connie, her boyfriend, and her sister were all arrested. Connie's sister actually ended up breaking out of prison and became the first woman in the US to land on the US Marshals Most Wanted list. After Leighton was born, her parents were released from prison, and eventually Leighton made her way to LA where she started her acting career. She's since had a lot of trouble with her mom, even going so far as to win custody of her brother, but that is another story for another time. At number 7, Adam Hicks. This one is for the Disney Channel kids. Did anyone watch the Disney Channel movie Lemonade Mouth? Well, one of the film's actors, Adam Hicks, has seen his fair share of troubles after leaving Disney. Yet another Disney actor gone rogue. 2018, Adam was arrested for armed robbery after it was believed that he committed four or five robberies along with his girlfriend, Danny Tamburo. According to sources, Adam and Danny allegedly committed these robberies by walking around the San Fernando Valley in California and would go up to innocent people and hold them at gunpoint and demand that they give them anything of value, whether that be cell phones, wallets, jewelry, or otherwise. Now, from what I've seen, there's no word on whether he's been sentenced, but he was being held in police custody with his bail being held at $550,000. His arraignment was postponed last time I checked, but other than that, this scandal has gone cold, so that's probably why no one has heard of it. At number six, Woody Harrelson. We know Woody Harrelson as a successful actor known for films like The Hunger Games, Now You See Me, and Natural Born Killers, but the latter is a movie that might hit Woody here a little close to home. You see, he's not the only one in his family to have notoriety because his father, Charles, has also garnered fame, but for all the wrong reasons. Woody Harrelson dad was a hitman. When paparazzi and reporters want to dig up your past views against you, this one will certainly strike a nerve with Woody. Charles Harrelson was a hitman known by most as the man who assassinated U.S. federal judge John H. Wood. According to Woody, his father Charles left the family when he was still young and said that he hadn't heard from him until 1981 when the news of his father's arrest was broadcast. Until his death in 2007, Woody had a strained relationship with his father, though he admitted that he would visit him in prison often. Of all the celebrity parents, Woody's dad was definitely one of the wildest. At number 5, Milli Vanilli. The lip sync scandal that surrounded Milli Vanilli was one of music's biggest scandals, and I've never heard about it. Have you? Essentially, Millie Vanilli was a musical duo that was never really real. I mean, they were real people, but their music wasn't theirs. The stage act was put together by German record producer Frank Farron in an attempt to create a star from scratch. He had a vision to be able to put out this amazing music, but he needed the perfect act to sell it. That's where Morvan and Politis came into play. These two dancers were hired by Farron to be the faces of Millie Vanilli, and though it was a musical act, they didn't have to sing. In fact, they never did. The songs were written and produced for them to lip sync to, and it worked for a while, but like all good things, they can never last. Millie Vanilli conquered the Billboard charts and even won a Grammy for their song, Girl You Know It's True. They were asked to tour and perform live, but since this act never actually sang, things started to get difficult for them and playing pretend wasn't working anymore. When they would encounter technical difficulties with their track while live, it was stressful and humiliating. Eventually, they were caught in their lie as their track suddenly stopped working during a live performance, revealing to the world that they were faking it all along. This took a huge toll on the duo, especially their mental health, driving Politis to take their own life. This ended in tragedy, but it was still a huge scandal at the time. At number four, Shia LaBeouf. Shia LaBeouf is always in some kind of trouble. He's either making waves in the media for acting a mess, whether that's being racist or pulling wild stunts. Most recently, he's faced backlash as he's been accused of harming his ex-girlfriend, FKA Twigs. But there's another scandal, rather scandals, that might not be as well known, and that's his plagiarism and lying. Shia LaBeouf has been caught plagiarizing people's work and lying about it on many occasions, but he's never really learned from his mistakes. He's been caught plagiarizing apologies, then plagiarizing other apologies to apologize for plagiaries. <laughs> He's copied the actions of Sia and the words of Tigger and a plethora of other people, but one of the biggest plagiarism scandals he faced is when he ripped off a plot from a graphic novel for his film, HowardCantor.com, which premiered at the Cannes Film Festival. When he got caught plagiarizing, he claimed that he had no idea that the plot was the same, and then when issuing a statement slash apology for his actions, he once again turned to plagiarism and copied a Yahoo Answers post. 
because of how many times he's done something like this, I have to wonder if he's doing this on purpose to make it his brand or something because he knows he's not getting away with it. At number three, Dr. Seuss. Recently, we've been hearing a lot of news about Dr. Seuss. Well, his books, really. Though he was a beloved children's book author, famous for creating The Cat in the Hat, The Grinch, and Horton Hears a Who, now people are finding out that some of his books contain racist imagery. Six of Dr. Seuss's books have now been pulled from his collection and will no longer be published because of racist imagery, but this discussion isn't new and has been a minor scandal for many, many years. A survey of Seuss's work found that the portrayal of black characters in his books relied heavily on, quote, anti-blackness and images of white supremacy, end quote. Schools and libraries have been banning many of Seuss's books because of the racist portrayals of non-white characters, and these criticisms have been linked as far back as the 80s. It's good to know that now people are recognizing racism and taking action to eliminate it from our world, so it's a good step forward. This scandal has been brewing in the background for some time now, so people are only now learning about it, which is probably why no one really knew about it until recently. At number two, Sinead O'Connor. In October 1992, Sinead O'Connor caused some controversy during her guest spot on SNL. She was brought on the show to be the evening's musical guest, and already people were a little confused by her as she refused to sing one of her songs from her recent album, at the time. She instead opted to sing an a cappella version of Bob Marley's song War. It was an intense performance and she even changed some of the lyrics to specifically mention young people. As the song came to an end and she was wrapping up her performance, she pulled out a photo of Pope John Paul II and tore it up saying, quote, fight the real enemy. Sinead's actions caused a huge stir. After her performance, NBC started receiving thousands of angry calls over the following days and even some celebrities came forward to criticize her actions. She wanted to bring attention to the Catholic Church's treatment of young people because she's had personal experience with such things. I never knew about the scandal, so I'm curious to know how many of you guys remember this. And finally, number one, Justin Bieber. Jay Beavs has had a plethora of scandals. As we all know, he's had a rough time in the public eye for many years, and he's caused a lot of trouble. His relationship with Selena Gomez, as well as many DUIs, music scandals, as well as being banned from some places are a few that come to mind. But one scandal that might be new to some is that in 2011, a woman alleged that Justin was the father of her child. Mariah Yeeter came forward in 2011 claiming that she had once met up with Justin backstage after one of his concerts and that he had fathered her child. When this news first broke, Justin said that he had never even met Mariah, let alone had a relationship with her. But since the media was blowing the story up and Mariah was looking to enter into a paternity suit, Justin agreed to take a DNA test to prove that the baby wasn't his. He ended up addressing this whole situation in his song Maria, but unfortunately for the Beebs, this kind of thing would happen again in 2013 with yet another fan. He didn't father any children though, so I guess that's good for him. Starting off at number 10, we have Solange attacked Jay-Z. Something we can never ever fully forget, but might slip our minds every once in a while, is when Solange beat up Jay-Z in an elevator. Well, Beyonce just watched and did nothing. And the best part is that TMZ has footage of the whole thing. And although we don't know for sure what caused the fight, with all the cheating rumors that were exposed after, it's safe to say that Jay cheated, with rumors swirling that Rachel Roy was actually the one he cheated with. The E! News source claimed that Roy, who used to work at Jay-Z's company Rockaware, had allegedly gotten a little too flirty with the rapper earlier in the evening, causing Beyonce to approach Rachel and let her know that the behavior was disrespectful and she wanted her out of their lives for good. And the fight caused so much attention that they were forced to make a joint statement. In summary, it read that their family had worked through the incident and that both parties apologized to each other. As well, they shut down rumors that Solange was intoxicated or erotic, saying that it was just a simple family fight. And I don't know about you guys, but my family fights do not look like that. <laughs> And at number nine, Justin Bieber and Frank. I don't think I can make a list like this without talking about the Biebs and talking about one of his past scandals. One that's quite a head scratcher is when he went to see Anne Frank's house and says that she would have been a believer. Like, does he really need to make everything about himself? After looking through the house, he wrote in the guest book, quote, truly inspiring to be able to come here. Anne was a great girl. Hopefully she would have been a believer. <laughs> and just yikes. One of the comments about the incident said, she would have been a what? 
that little idiot is way too full of himself. She's an important historical figure, show some respect. And that trip in general included tons of bad press for Justin, like when his pet monkey was seized in Germany by authorities. We can literally do a top 10 on Justin Bieber scandals. Let me know below if you want that. And at number eight, Christian Bale's outburst. Christian Bale looked incredibly bad when a leaked audio was released of him yelling at the top of his lungs on the set of a movie, with him yelling at two men who he claimed ruined the shot. The, the f are you doing? Are you professional or not? Yes, I am. Do I f***ing walk around and rip that? No, shut the f*** up, Bruce. Do I want? No. No. Don't shut me up. Am I going to walk around and rip your f***ing lights down? With Bale claiming that the crew member walked into Bale's eyeline during a take, distracting him. And the yelling and screaming that he does is insane. He sounds like an eight year old that needs a timeout, honestly. But Bale ended up apologizing, saying that he acted like a punk, along with tons of other sentiments that claimed that he was sorry. But that incident brought back claims made by his own family that he's unstable and needs help. Bale's own mother, named Jenny, told the press that incidents like this are what drove her to report her son for assault in London before the UK Dark Knight premiere. And at number seven, Britney Spears shaved head. This is one that I'm sure you all remember, but with the recent information that has come out, you might not realize the real reason that Britney shaved her head. Back in 2007, Britney broke the internet when paparazzi captured her having what looked like a mental breakdown. And since mental health wasn't a subject that was as talked about, people immediately went to the worst. But a tattoo artist that tattooed Britney right after the incident told the press what Britney said was her reason for the shave. She claimed Britney told her, quote, it was, you know, I just don't want anybody, anybody touching my head. I don't want anyone touching my hair. I'm sick of people touching my hair. And this could be linked to the fact that Britney had very little control over her life at that time and everyone was telling her what to do. We can assume this also includes her father, Jamie Spears, who she is now in a furious legal battle with. But there are also reports that Britney was using drugs at that time, and there are fears that her kids would get taken away if there were drugs found in her system, and apparently certain drugs can be found in your hair, so she shaved her hair so she would get to keep her kids. In at number six, Billy Bob Thornton and Angelina Jolie blood vials. Remember back when Billy Bob Thornton was married to Angelina Jolie? Seriously, I don't even know how that happened. But the media had an obvious fascination with the couple, but the most fascinating thing was the fact that they wore necklaces of each other's blood well married. And even though the media went wild with them, Thornton claimed later that it actually wasn't that big of a deal saying in an interview, the necklaces were a very simple thing. Hey, let's poke our fingers with a pen and smear a little blood on there, and when we're away from each other, we'll wear the necklace. It was that easy. But by the time it came out in the press, it sounded like we were wearing a bucket of blood around our necks. Continuing about the years between 1995 to 2003, he said it was a crazy time, that he's not very fond of it. And honestly, I don't care how you explain it, the blood thing is weird. Halfway number five, Kristen Stewart cheating. Kristen Stewart and Robert Pattinson were the hottest couple in Hollywood after the massive success of the Twilight Saga that brought them together. But everything changed when images were released of Kristen cheating with the director of the film that she was working on, Rupert Sanders. And to make things worse, Sanders was married with children. And after this one was released, it instantly became one of the biggest stories of that year, as nobody could believe Kristen would cheat. After the news was set on fire by this, Kristen ended up making a public apology to Pattinson, and they actually ended up getting back together. But they did eventually split for good a little while later. And at that time, I was obsessed with Twilight and their love story, and I just still can't believe that she cheated and like ruined that for all the fans. So sad. And at number four, Justin Timberlake, Janet Jackson, Super Bowl. This scandal completely rocked the world. It was brought up again when Justin Timberlake was asked to perform at the 2018 Super Bowl halftime show. And in case you don't already know, well the two were performing at the Super Bowl, at the very end of the performance, Justin ripped off a piece of clothing covering Janet's breast, and it ended up exposing her nipple to millions of people live on air. After the incident, the world was set ablaze, and tons of viewers were very angry. MTV was forced to make a statement saying, the tearing of Janet Jackson's costume was unrehearsed, unplanned, completely unintentional, and was inconsistent with the assurances we had about the content of the performance. Even worse, after the incident, many put the blame solely on Jackson, saying that she created the stunt, and it caused her career to take a massive hit. Years later, it's still a sore spot for everyone. In at number three, Reese Witherspoon arrested. In April of 2013, America's sweetheart Reese Witherspoon turned into its worst nightmare 
after she was arrested with her husband in Atlanta. It started when her husband, Jim Toth, was pulled over and arrested for suspicion of driving under the influence. And from the video, it was very clear that she did not respect authority and started to get in the cop's face when he was dealing with Toth. Reese was so out of line that the cop ended up arresting her. And while he was, she pulled the classic, do you know who I am? and told him that he was gonna know who she was soon. Reese, of course, issued an apology, but it's something the public will never truly forget. But in a way, it was somewhat helpful for her career, because it helped her create a rougher image and helped her to expand into more roles. In at number two, Caitlyn Jenner car accident. In 2015, right around the time that she made her very public transition, Caitlyn Jenner was involved in a deadly car crash in Malibu that ended up killing one woman. According to a video that was later leaked, it showed Jenner's black Escalade running into the back of another car, which then forced it into incoming traffic or collided with a Hummer. And it ended up killing animal rights activist and actress Kim Howe. After the incident, Jenner was not convicted of anything, as she was driving reasonably in the situation. But the worst part was that allegedly Jenner did not apologize to the victim's family and blame the accident on the victim. As well, since there was so much publicity surrounding Caitlyn's transition at that time, not a lot of people actually know that this accident took place. And finally, number one, Fergie pees herself. Another infamous moment that I didn't even know happened was when Fergie peed herself during a performance with the Black Eyed Peas. And it was so terrible that Fergie called it the most unattractive moment of her life. She later explained the incident further on a radio show. She said it was just a simple case of not having time to use the bathroom before the show. Basically, because of traffic, the act was very late to the venue, so when they arrived at the show, there was no time to do anything other than rush on stage. With her adding, it does not just happen all the time, adding, I wish it didn't happen. It was so embarrassing. And although I wouldn't consider this one a scandal, it was definitely extremely embarrassing and was talked about in the media for days. Number 10, germaphobe. While speaking to Jonathan Ross in a 2015 interview, Priscilla Presley revealed that her late ex-husband was terrified of germs and would take his phobia to the extreme. She claimed that he even refused to use anyone else's silverware, which even included the ones at high-end restaurants. She said that because of his secret germophobia, he never liked to go to other people's homes to eat because he would have to take his own silverware and that would often cause quite an uncomfortable situation, as you could imagine. Quote, and he didn't like drinking out of cups that other people had drunk out of, even restaurants or other people's homes. So when he drank, he would drink where the handle was, knowing that no one would ever drink at that side. Although this information is not widely known, Priscilla says Elvis has been that way ever since he was a child. She believed that he just didn't like to put his mouth where other people had put their mouth, especially with cutlery and dishes, which is definitely something most people wouldn't have known about the star. Number nine, liked younger women. In her book, Elvis and Me, Priscilla Presley wrote that she just turned 14 when she met Elvis Presley, who was 24 years old at the time and already an international superstar. Despite the scandal, they started an intimate courtship that lasted seven years before they eventually married in 1967. Now, the age difference is creepy on its own, but it becomes even creepier when you compare that to what Linda Thompson wrote in her own memoir. Thompson, who dated Elvis after his marriage to Priscilla ended, was also very young and inexperienced at the time. In fact, he allegedly told her, quote, I want to preserve you for as long as you need. Whatever he meant by that, it just sounds super icky. Elvis reportedly took advantage of his power to manipulate young, impressionable fans whenever he went on tour. Joel Williamson, who wrote a historical book about Elvis, claimed that two years before he met his future wife, the star took a group of three girls with him on tour for the purpose of, quote, pillow fights, tickling, and cuddling. Number eight, his vanity. Fame is a terrible drug that often pushes stars into the oddest methods of trying to stay thin and beautiful. Linda Thompson wrote in her memoir that Elvis's obsession with being slim would drive him to bizarre measures to keep the weight off, including an alleged two week period of sedation. That's exactly what it sounds like. Elvis mainly slept all day except for brief periods where he woke up long enough to go to the bathroom and eat a small portion of food before being sedated again and going back to sleep. She also claimed that he regularly did crash diets on just 500 calories a day. She also exposed his secret about why he constantly wore shirts with high collars. Apparently he did it to conceal his neck, which he actually hated. She wrote 
that the whole reason he wore the trademark style was to keep his quote skinny little chicken neck hidden from the public. Then at age 40, Elvis allegedly opted for a facelift. Quote, there has been speculation through the years that Elvis has his eyes done or some other mystery procedure, but that mini facelift was the extent of his plastic surgery. Well, it seems like his ex-wife was really intent on revealing a side of him that was incredibly vain. Number seven, pet chimpanzee. This one is really messed up. Billy Smith, who was a member of Elvis's entourage, openly talked about how Scatter, Elvis's pet chimpanzee, was essentially used as a party favor that they trained to harass women. It said that the chimp would often look for women at parties and grab onto their clothes. According to Smith, Scatter also drank heavily. Quote, he could down a fifth of liquor before you knew it. Smith remembered another time when Scatter was beaten by a woman at a party for misbehaving. There have been conflicting reports about what really happened to the chimp. Some state that he merely lost his life due to old age, but Smith speculated that Scatter was poisoned by one of the maids who was tasked with feeding him after he was abandoned by Elvis and the crew who were out on the road. Although it's unclear exactly how he passed, it appears as though Scatter took his last breath on his own after years of living the party lifestyle. The whole thing was really rather sad as it seemed like Elvis and his friends used the chimp just to entertain themselves and discarded him when they went on tour. Number six, attacked his fiance. After Linda Thompson, Elvis briefly dated Mindy Miller before becoming involved with Ginger Alden, who was a full 20 years younger than him. It was only two months into their relationship when Elvis proposed to her and she accepted. The couple planned to walk down the aisle just a few months before Elvis's untimely death and Alden even said how excited he was about their wedding and their future together as a couple. She revealed to Express that during his final days, quote, Elvis was looking forward to many things, marriage, more children, serious films, and his next tour. But Elvis was reportedly very manipulative when it came to women and could be extremely jealous and controlling. According to sources close to the star at the time, he could get very violent. His treatment of her was horrifying and the pair constantly argued during their time together. After one particular fight, he allegedly asked someone in his entourage to pop the tires on Alden's car so she couldn't leave his home. And on another occasion, when she was driving away after an argument, Elvis reportedly aimed his weapon at her car and fired. Number five, allegations of racism. Last year, Quincy Jones revealed to The Hollywood Reporter that he always refused to work with Elvis because he was a racist. The musician best known for producing Michael Jackson's albums, Thriller, Off the Wall, and Bad, made the comments about Elvis's supposed history of racism in his new interview. The outlet asked Jones about Presley after the producer compared Jackson to the king of rock and roll. The 88-year-old musician and producer described a time when he was writing for the orchestra leader Tommy Dorsey in the 50s, and Elvis came in saying, quote, I don't want to play with him. Jones went on to call Elvis a racist and added, quote, but every time I saw Elvis, he was being coached by Otis Blackwell, telling him how to sing. And while there wasn't an overwhelming amount of accusations surrounding Elvis's past racism, there are certainly many allegations against the icon for appropriating black culture and repackaging it to the general public as his own. Despite this, it's obvious that American society still allowed him to have a very successful career, whether it was something the late singer did consciously or subconsciously. Number four, hidden children. Even though he has been gone for many, many years, Elvis Presley has always been the center of several new scandals and controversies. One of the many that have hit the headlines in the last few years is that the king of rock and roll supposedly kept hidden children from the rest of the world. The National Enquirer actually conducted a two-year investigation into the hidden children of the Presley family, reportedly acquiring witness testimonies, checking receipts, mail correspondence, birth certificates, and even DNA tests. The result of the investigation allegedly proves that Elvis did have several additional children that were being kept away from the spotlight of Hollywood. In fact, multiple alleged mothers of Elvis's hidden children have come forward to tell their stories about how they met the star, and the stories have some strange similarities. One example is Desiree Romaine Presley, who is the daughter of Lucy de Barbin, and she claims that her mother was in a 24 year long relationship with Elvis and was being kept away from the media. But the crazy thing is that Desiree's father is listed as Randolph Presley on her birth certificate, someone who allegedly worked at the Air Force Base in Oklahoma City. Number three, addicted to medication. It's not unheard of for celebrities to turn to substances as a way to cope with fame and just how crazy their lives become in the spotlight. But Elvis's alleged addictions could have had a very different origin when you look at the tragedy of his mother's passing. In 1958, he was drafted into the US Army, he went to Germany, but had to return to the US less
less than six months later because of his mother's untimely death. Many people believe that this marked the beginning of the end for Elvis, who quickly headed down a path of self-destruction. As soon as he returned to Germany, it's reported that Elvis partied heavily and would often get into fights. During this time, he also started taking illegal substances to try and deal with the grief of losing his mother. This probably snowballed and it's assumed that from that moment on, the misuse of substances played a major role in his life. Linda Thompson wrote several examples in her memoir about these incidents and says that she often found Elvis passed out in a bowl of chicken noodle soup under the influence of sedatives. She even says that doctors tried to hospitalize him for two weeks after misusing a combination of medication for far too long. Number two, why Priscilla ended things. Because she was only 14 years old when their courtship began, it's really no surprise that she missed out on a huge chunk of her adolescence. She told Jonathan Ross in 2015, quote, I was kind of lost, really in who I was earlier in my life. I really didn't have teenage years. After their first child, Lisa Marie was born, Priscilla accused Elvis of not wanting to sleep with her after she had given birth. Elvis told her that he wanted her to recover, but Priscilla later wrote in her memoir that he had mentioned before they were married that he had never been able to make love with a woman who'd had a child. In fact, throughout their marriage, Elvis continued to cheat on Priscilla with other women, and she herself had her own affair with an owner of a dance studio. It's safe to say that their marriage never really recovered. They finalized their divorce in 1973, and she said that this was because her life was his life, which meant her problems were always going to be secondary. Years later, she admitted that she did not divorce him because she didn't love him, but because she had to find out about the world. She was clearly just way too young when they started seeing each other. Number one, erratic violence. In recent years, Linda Thompson has been pretty open about her time with Elvis Presley, stating, quote, we all knew how dangerous Elvis's rage could be. Apparently, when she first noticed Elvis could get pretty angry was when someone reportedly stole personal photos of one of his ex-girlfriends with another woman. She claimed that he then decided to show off his samurai sword collection while under the influence of illegal substances and left her fearing for her life. Although she said that he was true to his word and he didn't in fact hurt her, she was concerned because his talents were entirely impaired due to the narcotics. These were just some of the several times that his ex said that she worried about his boiling rage. Apparently, the musician even invested in a concealed carry permit to take the weapons on stage with him, including several that were actually stuffed into his shoes, just in case someone got a little bit too rowdy in the crowd. Even singer Tom Jones spoke about Elvis's love of weapons during a visit to his dressing room. Tom said that he noticed a loaded weapon just sat on the side and simply handed it to Elvis by wrapping it in a towel. Sounds a little crazy to me. Starting off this countdown in no particular order, we have Woody Harrelson. Woody Harrelson's dad, Charles Harrelson, was an American hitman and organized crime figure. Yes, you heard me correctly. Beloved actor Woody Harrelson had a father who was a cold-blooded killer. He was just seven at the time when his father first went to prison. It said that he was responsible for the deaths of at least 20 people. In 1979, that is when Charles committed his biggest kill of all time. He took out a federal judge by the name of Judge John H. Wood Jr. He was the first federal judge to be killed in the 20th century. He was paid $250,000 to kill off this judge. It was because a drug dealer was about to be sentenced by this judge who was known as Maximum John because he always gave out really harsh punishments to drug dealers. So he got Charles to knock him off for him. But this landed him behind bars and in solitary confinement. He was there until he was 69 when he died from a heart attack. Obviously, Woody does not want to be defined by his father's actions. In our ninth spot, we have Joaquin Phoenix. Joaquin is one of the few actors who actually grew up in a cult. He was born into the commune of Children of God. But when he was four years old, his parents managed to escape the cult and move. That's actually why they changed their last name to Phoenix, as it symbolizes rebirth, since they were able to leave this cult and start a new life. Unfortunately, he also lost his brother at a young age. In 1993, his brother River Phoenix died from an Dose. Joaquin witnessed this happen and he was the one that called 911. In our eighth spot today, we have Phil Lewis. Phil Lewis is best known for his role of Mr. Mosby on The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody. And I freaking love that show. Like, it was honestly my childhood. Well, before his Disney Channel days, he actually killed someone. In December of 1991, Lewis fatally hit a 21 year old woman. She passed away from her injuries from the hit. It was found that Lewis was driving while intoxicated. His blood alcohol levels were three times 
times the legal limit of intoxication. As a result, he was convicted of a DUI as well as manslaughter. He was sentenced to five years in prison, two years probation, and 350 hours of community service. But he managed to only serve one year in prison. I guess Disney was able to overlook his past when he auditioned for Mosby on the show. In our seventh spot today, we have Tim Allen. Now, if you look at Tim Allen, you think, oh, he's such a family man. I love Home Improvement and Toy Story. He's a great actor. Well, Tim Allen actually had quite a dark past before he got into acting. In 1978, Allen was arrested for attempting to traffic more than 650 grams of he was arrested in Kalamazoo Battle Creek International Airport. Now, he actually would have served a lifetime in prison, but he avoided this by giving police information about other dealers. As a result, his sentence was reduced to three to seven years. He ended up serving two years and four months in prison and then was granted parole in 1981. I guess that's why they say don't judge a book by its cover because he looks like a wholesome dad, not a drug trafficker. In our sixth spot, we have Jack Nicholson. In 1974, Time Magazine discovered that Jack's sister, June, was actually his mother, not his sister. How wild is that? So June was only 17 when she became pregnant with Jack, and she wasn't married, so her parents agreed to raise the child as their own, with Jane and Lorraine acting like his older sisters. So his parents were actually his grandparents, and his sister Lorraine was his aunt. In regards to his dad, we don't know for sure who is his dad, but some say it was likely June's manager. Other sources claim June really just doesn't know who the father was. By the time Jack found this all out, his mom, June, and his grandma had already passed away. Imagine how that would have changed his life. Like he was raised on a lie. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with Sean Penn. A number of women have come forward saying that Sean Penn has been aggressive towards them. In fact, he has mistreated a number of his partners, including Madonna. They were married from 1985 to 1989. While in December of 1988, Penn allegedly tied Madonna to a chair and held her hostage for nine hours and apparently hit her multiple times. When he untied her to let her use the bathroom, she fled to the police station. One officer said, and I quote, Madonna staggered into the station. She was distraught, crying, with makeup smeared all over her face. I hardly recognized her. She had obviously been struck. Sean was charged with inflicting corporal injury and traumatic conditions on Madonna, as well as battery. But Madonna withdrew her complaint a week later and has rarely commented on it since, which is quite odd. Why would she say that he harmed her and then retract the statement? So who knows what really happened? Happened. Moving on to number four, we have Leighton Meester. Now, I personally did not know this, but Blair Waldorf, aka Leighton Meester, wasn't always the queen bee of Manhattan. In fact, she was born in prison. Basically, her mom was serving a sentence after smuggling a lot of marijuana out of Jamaica with the help of Leighton's dad and Aunt Judy. All of them ended up behind bars. In fact, her aunt managed to escape prison and became America's first woman on the US Marshals 15 most wanted list. How insane is that? In the end, Leighton's grandmother raised her while her mom served 16 months in prison. Thank gosh she didn't follow in her family's footsteps. In our third spot, we have Christopher Walken. Christopher Walken was involved in a death that is just shrouded in mystery. On November 29th, 1981, 43 year old actress Natalie Wood was found dead, floating face down in the Pacific Ocean. She was on a yacht with her husband Robert Wagner and Christopher Walken when this happened. The thing is, no one really knows what happened to her. Some say she slipped off the deck and fell into the water, while others are convinced that her husband or Christopher Walken had something to do with it, or that they know what happened. One theory is that Natalie and Christopher were having an affair. Wagner found out about it, got mad, and pushed her off the yacht. Now, Wagner seems to be the prime suspect, but many Many people think that Walken knows exactly what happened. I mean, he barely even talks about the case, and on the rare occasion that he did, he would call in an accident, and also, he was absent from the documentary about her. All I'm gonna say is, someone knows something. I'm getting the vibe that Walken knows what happened, and maybe he just feels guilty about it. In our second spot, we have Charlize Theron. Charlize Theron actually had a very traumatic upbringing. Her dad struggled with alcohol addiction and would constantly threaten Charlize and her mom, Gerda. He would never physically hurt her, but he would hurt Gerda. One night in June of 1991, he got angry and fired shots at both of them. During that altercation, Gerda ran and grabbed her own handgun that she had kept hidden and shot him back. Her shots killed him while Charlize watched it all unravel. In the end, it was declared self-defense and Gerda never faced any charges. But think how traumatic that must have been for her to see her mother shoot and 
her dad as a teenager. And in our number one spot today, we have Ashton Kutcher. Now, I never knew this, and I was incredibly shocked when I found out about it. But on February 21st of 2001, Ashton Kutcher went over to his then girlfriend's house, Ashley Elrin. The two had planned on going to a post Grammy party, but when he knocked on the door, there was no answer. That's because Ashley was dead on the floor of her home. She had been stabbed 47 times by a man named the Hollywood Ripper. He was responsible for the death of up to 10 women. As a result, Ashton Kutcher lost his girlfriend very suddenly and in a very traumatic way. He was also scared that he was going to be a suspect in the murder investigation since his fingerprints were on her door, but he never was, but he did have to testify in court. Starting off this countdown in no particular order, we've got John Hamm. John Hamm is most notably famous for his role in the hit television series Mad Men as a cutthroat advertising executive. What he may not want you to know about him, however, were his less than savory college days that landed him in some serious trouble. In 1990, John was arrested for his alleged role in a fraternity hazing that turned horribly violent. His fraternity house was even dissolved after Ham and his friends harmed a pledge so violently that he was in the hospital, even going as far as to light him on fire. John was charged with a misdemeanor offense, and when he was asked about it in 2018, his response wasn't the best. Well, I was essentially acquitted. I wasn't convicted of anything. I was caught up in a big situation, a stupid kid in a stupid situation, and it was a bummer. I moved on from it. Okay, now we're moving on, I guess. In at number nine is Richard Pryor, the iconic comedian who is often cited as direct inspiration for other comedy legends like Eddie Murphy and Dave Chappelle, Pryor changed the game. But what you may not know is that there was an extremely dark past behind the All Smiles comic. Richard grew up in an extremely unstable childhood, raised by a substance using mother in a brothel in Illinois. Richard saw things that no child should ever have to see, and to cope with such a horrifying childhood, he also turned to substance use to self-medicate. Richard was married seven times to five different women who had trouble with the comic's insatiable personal life. He even almost passed away at his own hand when he doused himself in rum and lit himself on fire while using substances. Pryor's friend even stated in an interview, quote, he has about 13 personalities, and while you could deal with nine of them, the other four are a nightmare. At number eight is Billy Tipton. Billy Tipton, if you haven't heard of him, was a revered jazz musician who rose to fame in the 1940s and 1950s. He lived his life in relative normalcy outside of his celebrity status. Although he was never married, he did have five serious girlfriends, all of whom referred to themselves as Miss Tipton. Eventually, he settled down with a woman named Kelly, and they adopted three sons together. It wasn't until his death from a stomach ulcer in 1989 that, as he was being rushed to the hospital, his giant secret was uncovered. Billy Tipton was born a woman and had concealed his sex throughout his entire life, even from his relationships. The revelation came as, quote, a shock to nearly everyone, including the women who had considered themselves his wives, as well as his sons and the musicians who traveled with him. To explain away any intimacy that would have happened between his partners, Billy reportedly said that he was in a serious car accident that mutilated his body, leaving him unable to perform. At the time this was revealed, it sent shockwaves through the music scene where trans performers were basically completely unheard of. In at number seven is Prince. The iconic pop singer is considered one of the greatest musicians to have ever lived, but he also had a secret that was only uncovered upon his tragic and sudden death in 2016. After he passed, many stories started to come to light as both bank statements became public and from various sources. These bank statements revealed that Prince had been secretly donating insane sums of money to various charities throughout his life, each with the condition that the donation be private and that the donor be kept a secret. A few organizations that he did support in the days before his death were the Harlem Children's Zone and Uptown Dance Academy in New York. He even donated $12,000 to the Louisville Free Public Library in order to keep it from closing, all under the condition that they keep his name unlisted from donor records. He reportedly gave thousands away at a time, particularly to charities related to children, as his own child tragically passed away after only six days of life. He also focused on environmental issues, and uniquely, unlike a lot of celebrities who choose to invest so they get a financial return, Prince just donated to foundations that support environmental causes and a transition to solar power. Number six, Jimmy Page. Jimmy Page is the virtuoso guitarist and founder of Led Zeppelin. Jimmy is largely known as one of the greatest guitarists in the history of rock music. I mean, he set the standard for the many who have imitated his electric style. Yet, what he may not want you to know about him is his predatory relationship with a young girl who was only 14 at the time. While he toured with Led Zeppelin, Jimmy dated Lori Maddox, although they kept their relationship extremely private and basically hidden because it was, you know, illegal and creepy. Even in the loose 70s, 
this relationship could have put Paige in jail. They dated for a little while, and who knows what they did behind the scenes, but Jimmy eventually dumped her for BB Bell, who was of age at the time, thank God. Either way, not a fan of this one. In at number five is Matthew Broderick. Matthew Broderick is known largely for his titular role as Ferris Bueller in the John Hughes coming of age film, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. He was also in The Producers and a bunch of other A-list movies. What you may not know about him, however, is that he was directly involved and in fact caused the death of numerous people. He and Jennifer Grey, the star of Dirty Dancing, were on a romantic vacation in Ireland when Matthew head on hit the car of a 28 year old woman and her mother. Both women were pronounced dead at the hospital. The road was straight and easy to navigate. The issue was that they were in Ireland and he, out of habit, drove on the wrong side of the road, which led to the crash. Following the accident, Broderick was convicted of careless driving but was only fined $175, which to this day the family of the victims called a quote, travesty of justice. At number four is Jackie Chan. While Jackie Chan appeared as a comedic kung fu fighting man on the screen, his personal life is absolutely insane and surprisingly not well known. In fact, Jackie himself didn't know until well into his career just how many secrets were being kept in his family. He learned in 2003 that he had two secret brothers living in China and that his father was a nationalist spy on secret missions to bust substance crime in mainland China. In fact, that's where he met Jackie's mother. In what seems like a moment straight out of a noir crime boss movie, Jackie's father met his mother, Li Li Chan, because he was sent to bust her as an infamous dealer and legendary gambler in Shanghai. So his mother was one of the lords of the Chinese underbelly and his father was sent to arrest her. The two fled to Australia together where they lived until their death. Jackie's father also revealed that the actor's real family name isn't Chan at all, but rather Fang. How's that for a family reunion? In at number three is Rose McGowan. Rose was one of the founding spokespersons in the Me Too movement, joining dozens of women who brought Harvey Weinstein to justice. She is best known for her 90s movies like Jawbreaker, Scream, and Encino Man. But what you may not know about her is her rather horrifying upbringing. She was born in Florence, Italy, where her parents lived in a commune called the Children of God. Basically, she was born into a cult that had mass allegations of horrifying crimes against humanity. I can't really say what they are because of YouTube restrictions, but if you're curious, I suggest you look into it with a serious content warning in mind. The cult in question lured people in with promises of all kinds of physical intimacy and activities with extremely young women set to perform such acts on the men in the cult. Luckily for Rose, she was largely protected from the more heinous side of the cult and she and her family fled when she was 14 years old, where quote, we hid in an old stone house and had to boil pots of water to take baths. The cult sent people to find us. I remember a man trying to break in with a hammer. Number two on the list, Rihanna. While the celebrity singer is in the news lately for her exciting pregnancy with ASAP Rocky, what you may not know about her is her rather insane early life and the secrets that they kept even from her until they were finally brought to light. Old family photos were unearthed that reveal a secret side of the family that Rihanna herself rarely ever talks about, her father's other kids. Rihanna has three older siblings through her father by three different women as he admitted to being quite the womanizer in his heyday. Her and her father have an extremely complicated relationship as he has dealt with substance use issues for most of his life. And now to find out that she had three other siblings she knew nothing about, it's a wonder the two have stuck together through so much. And in at number one is Mark Wahlberg. The actor and singer needs no introduction, but he may need a little disclaimer beside his name for the rather horrifying incident he caused in the 80s. When he was 16 years old, Mark had an extremely harsh life and he ended up brutally harming an elderly Vietnamese man in a racially motivated attack. He shouted slurs at him while physically harming him so badly that Mark was charged with attempted murder. While he was sentenced to two years in prison, for some reason he only served 45 days. In a beautiful show of faith, his victim, whose name is Johnny Trin stated that he forgives Mark. Quote, everyone deserves another chance. He was young and reckless, but I forgive him now. He paid for his crime when he went to prison. Mark got a pardon from the court, basically exonerating him from his crime, an action that he later stated he regrets. Quote, I didn't need that. I spent 28 years righting the wrong. I was relieved to find out that the injuries to his eye had occurred in the early 70s and not from the incident that happened that night, but I was able to meet with him and his wife and his daughter and apologize for these horrific acts. Some good can come out of it.